special guest. And we have with us today, we have Junte Lane, and he is a digital marketing strategist. He is the founder of Digital Brand Institute, and he is the former senior brand manager for the University of Southern California. He also has worked with many brands, including Coca-Cola, Sony, and, uh, Paramount Pictures, Verizon, and I could go on and on. <laughs> and then one other thing he may not realize I know about him is he recently completed his pilot's license. So congratulations <laughs> on that. Thank you, Marlies. Thank you. <laughs> so it's great to have you here today. Yeah, great so to be here. We're going to talk about future-proofing your brand. So okay. tell us a little bit about what exactly do you mean by future-proofing your brand? Yeah, well, essentially, we all know what the world is going through, right? The greatest pandemic in our lifetime. Uh, and it's, of course, affecting many, many, many businesses. It doesn't matter what industry you're in, you are obviously affected. Uh, and so when I talk about future-proofing your digital brand, it's something that I do with plenty of my clients at Digital Delane, which is a, a full-service agency. And we essentially uh, focus on building a brand that would outlast the pandemic you know, providing my clients the tips, tricks, uh, and insights on uh, helping them to to focus um, their on adapting their business model, making any pivots, things like that. So, future proofing your your brand is all about making sure that you're leveraging your internal assets, right? Obviously, you don't have uh, a room to scale at this point. Um, it's all about collaborating with other potential partners. Um, and it also, it's all about making sure that you do what you can to stay top of mind during this time. Because even if your target audience isn't necessarily in the buying market now, you ultimately want to stay top of mind with them so that once this thing uh, boils over, uh, you would be top of mind and you can go ahead and, and reach out and engage with them during that time. So those are all a, a couple key points uh, when focusing on how to future-proof your brand. Well, and we're going to break down several of those points that you just addressed. Sure. And go ahead to anybody, if you want to put a comment and a question in the comments, go ahead and do that. And we'll ask those as we go along as well. Okay. But um, so as B2B marketers, which is what most of our crowd here is, how do you do that whole, um, you know, sensitivity and, and personal touch? How do you, how can you do that in, a, in an appropriate way in a situation like this? Yeah, well, I think first and foremost, um, the old adage is people like to do business with people and it's similar in the B2B industry as well, right? And so I think uh, businesses want to do business business with other businesses that are aligned with some of their ideologies, with some of their mission values and so on. And so if you're able to uh, express um, the the effort to understand what's going on in society um, that could be affecting the lives of, you know, uh, leadership in these organizations or even trickling down to their specific audience base. Um, I think it's going to build a better relationship in this environment. And so some tricks and, and tips that I would, would focus on as a B2B um, company is focusing on, um, again, establishing the, the core values of your organization and also providing resources for other organizations, for other target organizations that, that you have in mind. Because ultimately, during this time, as a brand, as a business, you're looking for the best ways to position yourself in this current market. So by simply being um, a an example or a resource, I think is one way that you're able to do it. Um, and this could be uh, simply reaching out from a business perspective to see, you know, how they're they're faring in this industry in the market um and also some tools that have helped you as a business you can pretty much impart that information and give them that resource and so those are one ways that you can still begin to build those relationships during this time well so a lot of that it comes down to having personal one-on-one -on -one conversations exactly with your, your clients at this point in time too and and i like how you said you know reaching out 
person to person, not thinking of it as business to business so much. And and I know that's what I tried to pick up the phone and call some of my clients during this time as mm -hmm. well. And just, hey, you know, how are you doing? How, you know, and especially if I know they have kids or, right. you know, how are you dealing with the kids being home and all that kind of thing. So you're right. It really, if you can reach them on that personal level, it really does take it to a whole, take the relationship to a whole different level. For sure. I mean, I, I you know, I have clients that um, are executives and they're also moonlighting as teachers, right? Because their children aren't in school. And so those are some challenges that I think could just be, they could be brought up, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's sort of going against, you know, the formal way of communicating, but ultimately, you know, if, if, you know, your target audience or your client has children, that's probably something that they're dealing with. And it's, it's difficult, um, when understanding or when, when, uh, um, uh, considering what they're going through at the time period, and then focusing on ways that you can essentially help at least to, to build a bridge or to break that ice. Um, cause I think it's going to provide a, a better relationship, uh, f uh, foundation. So I would highly recommend that. Well, let's talk a little bit about, I know you're big on brand storytelling. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about how how to use that tool at this point in time to, to really relate as well. Yeah. Well, again, it, it goes back to, again, people knowing who you are, your true, your mission, your values, and so on. And then telling your brand story um, as to why you're even in business and how your business is impacting the lives of your target audience. And if you haven't figured that out, then you certainly are going to need to start to focus, especially during this time, on establishing your brand story. And essentially it's it's your why. Why are you in business? Why is is why did you hire this particular employee? Why have you developed this this initiative? Why have you established a strategic partnership? Why are you even at this event, right? So on and so forth. So it's it's important to to map out your brand map out your why so that you can uh, convey that through your brand story. Well, so again, it goes back to humanizing and and making it personable. So, so how do we deal with um, talking about how we stand out from the competition without going negative, mm. like the politicians always do? <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole nother story. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I can say about that is, you know, if you are um, a B2B business and you're looking at trying to, to, to stay uh, top of mind, um, sort of, you know, focus on you know, reaching out to, to your target audience and, and, and so on, um, it's important to include your personality because ultimately your personality is is going to get give you the reach that you need and here's what i mean by that in particularly on social media we know that the algorithms reward personality so if you have direct promotional or salesy communication on social media you'll notice that your organic reach won't be as great but right. if you are focused on more personality um, then you're going to have more organic reach and then you're going to have people reacting to that that post with a bunch of personality, right? And what happens there is you start to get more organic reach because more people start to communicate. And once people start to communicate and engage, their network are informed, so on and so forth. So you actually have a significant benefit for being more personal if you are a very buttoned up B2B brand. If you sort of you know, uh, relax on your brand voice a bit, start more conversations around different topics that have to do with your brand, you'll start to notice your organic reach. So providing that personality in terms of your, your brand voice to your target audience is going to be beneficial because you're going to better reach your target audience. So do you have some good, I know I'm kind of throwing this at you. No worries, no worries. Do you have some examples of, of some, especially B2B, but like any any companies that you can give just as examples of what's a good, um, you know, like you said, showing your personality as a brand. Yeah, you know, I think a good uh, case study would be uh, the Wendy's Roast. If you're not familiar with that, um, 
obviously Wendy's was, you know, sort of a, a, a blase blob brand. It's very vanilla in a sense. And, and they started to, to add more personality to their Twitter feed. And they started basically roasting everyone from their competitors to people who engage with their timeline, so on and so forth. And they actually had so much, en- so, so much engagements that um, it brought in more traffic to, into the stores. Um, people who didn't engage with Wendy's earlier on did so just for the entertainment value. And that obviously b- kept Wendy's top of mind, which brought more people into the stores. And so they switched it up a little bit during the pandemic by going from, from uh, roasting to toasting which basically means that they, they flipped it and they said, okay, instead of roasting people, we're going to talk about the good things that people are doing in the community, highlighting those, those different things, and then rewarding them with free nuggets and stuff like that, right? So I think that's a great example of, of how you should leverage a brand voice. And if, if your brand voice didn't have any personality before, you can take some cues as, as long as it's aligned with, with your brand um, from Wendy's and their roast and apply it to yours. And I think the, the ultimate lesson here was Wendy's went from servitude to attitude, right? So normally when you think about social media, you'd automatically assume from a B2B perspective, overall, you'd automatically assume it's all about thought leadership or customer service right? So if you go from focusing on customer service only to having a little bit of attitude, having some personality, you're, you're, again, you're going to notice more organic reach. And so that's important because nowadays we know that when on social pro- profiles and accounts, people want to be entertained, right? So they don't, they aren't necessarily engaging with a brand simply to get their brand information, right? They want to be entertained. So it's, it's important that you go from that servitude to attitude and, and not only use your social channels as a way uh, of, of communicating customer service transactions, but focus on providing some type of value in terms of, of attitude, personality, and entertainment. Well, and I love how you were talking about how Wendy switched to doing the toasting and, and, and praising people for what they were doing. I'm sure that yeah. got lots of attention because people are, you know, everybody loves that kind of thing and, the, and it probably got a lot more shares and likes as well. Yeah, exactly. Well, so let's talk a little bit. You had mentioned earlier about leveraging your existing assets. So talk a little bit more about, because I think probably a lot of people, you know, when you start at you may have seen I put Matt's comment up there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's going to start roasting people, so we're going to look out, right? <laughs> um, but you know what? It, if you're if you're looking at this and you're thinking, "Oh my goodness!" Now all of a sudden I got to create all this new stuff and figure out how what my personality is. How could you take some existing assets and and use those to your advantage? Yeah. So if if you're struggling, if you're you know st- either stuck on that hamster wheel of creating content for content's sake, um, or you just don't have time to create content, um, my mantra is is work smarter, right? And one of the ways that you're able to work smarter is by repurposing some of your existing content. So if you start off with a blog post or a video, um, let's say, for example, you take this live stream and we transcribe that live stream. We make that transcription into a blog post. We repurpose some of the uh, quotables, some of the, the, you know, gym dropping, mic dropping moments um, and, and create Instagram quote images, statistics, things like that um, from this main piece of content, which is, of course, the live stream. So that's one way that you can focus on repurposing uh, your content. The other way is to take a look at what content has worked for you in the past, meaning that uh, what content has brought in the most leads, um, has gotten the most views, and so on. And when you think about, and when you analyze that, you also want to focus on the content that's actually converting, right? So you may not necessarily need to look specifically at the vanity metrics of, oh, this blog post or this video had the most views, but it's more about which video, which blog post actually converted. Because what you can do here is once you understand uh, what video is converted, you can then beef up that content, right? To draw more eyeballs and get more views on that content, right? So it all starts off with that pre-existing asset of the blog post, the video, the live stream, and so on. 
Um, and then of course, most of us are too busy to continuously create content, right? So my focus here is I just simply batch content. Because consider, you know, for all those who, who bake, right, you know that you would never, ever bake one cookie at a time, right? You would put all the cookies on a baking pan and then bake them all at once. You do the same thing for your content, right? And that's naturally going to help. So uh, if you are planning to do videos, you may want to batch some of your video creation. You may want to batch some of your blog posts and articles that you're writing um, during a time when you have complete focus and ability to create content. So those are my, my few recommendations on how you can use your, your internal assets um, to uh, create content and to uh, stay top of mind uh, during this time. Well, and you talk about repurposing. It took me several months of doing virtual lunch before I finally woke up to, oh yeah, I should repurpose it for the podcast <laughs> as well. So, <laughs> it is true. It's yeah. like you create it once and use it in multiple places, multiple times. Exactly. Well, you had also mentioned collaboration. And mm -hmm. I think, especially for the trade show and events industry right now, I think we're, we're really looking to how can we all team up and support each other. So what are some of your suggestions as far as collaborating to create content and to, to get that message out there? Yeah, and that's that's a great question. And I think if you are in the trade in trade show industry, um, you've leveraged trade shows in the past. Obviously, that's not the case anymore, right? So most of those events are either canceled or they're they're gone virtual. So when you think about that from a virtual standpoint, um, you're obviously able to to do leverage um, more in the digital space than you may have in the physical space. So you would make sure that you have all of your lead generation funnels and so on and so forth um, together. And then you would also want to make sure that you are um, going above and beyond in terms of the sponsorship uh, that you're, that you are um, uh, uh, booking. Right. And so I, my rule of thumb is it should be three times, whatever the investment uh, is for the sponsorship the activations outside of that should be threefold, right? And so that could be, uh, you know, creating Facebook ads as a part of um, your collaboration with that particular event. Um, it could be activating some ambassadors, um, posting on social media, creating um, content uh, around the event, so on and so forth. That would happen in the digital space. Um, and then when it comes to just the general collaboration overall, Obviously, you know, some of our marketing budget is, is tight, right? We're tightening the belt. One of the ways that you're able to collaborate in during this time is by uh, joining in with a partner that either provides an ancillary service um, or as some type of strategic partner that you've worked with in the past and then create co-branded campaigns. So these could be essentially uh, Facebook ads um, that are co-branded, right? And just making sure that the final creative um, nicely showcases the way both brands are able to work together to help solve some type of challenge. Again, that's very important, right? This is not just, hey, this is a Facebook ad with two partners, but this is a Facebook right. ad, right? That has um, a, a collaboration that can help meet your target audience's challenge, right? So that's very important. And of course, you're basically splitting the ad spend down in half uh, and you're able to collect um, some of the data from your strategic partner and vice versa. Right. So those are some ways that you're able to, to focus on collaborations during this time. Um, but most importantly, it's you want to make sure that you're working with the right partner in the digital space. So you may have a partner that has a great brick and mortar brand. You may be more um, advanced in digital. So you want to basic, basically align yourself with someone that's that's equal on that field uh, in terms of, of you guys both having an advanced digital brand. That way, your co-branded campaign would be much, much more fruitful. So just consider those couple facts when looking at collaborating during this time. Well, and that makes sense too, because otherwise, if you're not equally matched, then you know if one of them is much more... Um, 
much more advanced, I guess. Yeah. Advanced, mm-hmm. yeah, advanced in the digital arena, then they would be carrying most of the weight. Right. So it makes sense that you find a company that's a good match that way. So, and note to everybody, if you're here at virtual lunch, this may be a good place to find some of those matches for your, uh, your collaboration projects. So, well, if you have any last minute questions, go ahead and put those in the comments and mm-hmm. we will ask Jonte. Um, but, you know, any final thoughts from you? Something maybe that we forgot to address during this interview? No, I think ultimately this was 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 great. Uh, you know, hopefully I provided you guys with a, a, a ton of value. Um, feel free to reach out to me uh, and my agency, digitaldelane.com, if you have any questions or if you're looking for ways in which that you can navigate through this time. We've helped plenty of partners, um, even in, in, um, you know, uh, the B2B space, um, br- people who have, or brands that have a great brick and mortar, um, but are looking to transition or create a go-to-market strategy, things like that. Um, I certainly can be in a, of assistance. Sounds great. And mm-hmm. we'll make sure we get that get your uh, web address in the show notes and the comments and everything as well. So Great. I don't see any last minute comments. So thank you so much of course. for taking time out to be here for virtual lunch today. And thanks to everybody who joined us. We will be back again next Tuesday. We're going to take off the day after Labor Day, but we, we will be here next Tuesday. So we will see you then. And everybody in the meantime, have a great week. Thanks. Bye everybody. All right. All right. Thank awesome. You. Yeah. Uh, and, and perfect how you said that about repurposing. And I'm like, oh, yeah. I can't yeah. the fact that now it's on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and apologies for, for uh, getting a little flustered earlier on with uh, me coming on. I just had some technical uh, if, if, dif- technical difficulties with my mic, but uh, oh, yeah, we're able to I, I, get that. have an email from me because I'm like, are you having trouble? <laughs> <laughs> I think we got one last comment that didn't make it in time. Too many mm-hmm. companies fear attitude because there are risks of going too far. How do they manage it? Oh, well, we didn't get that question. Yeah. Either, but... Um, but maybe uh, you could pop on to YouTube at some point and okay. just answer that sure. question there sure. in the comment. Yep. So, yep. Um, yeah, that's the problem with online. Sometimes it takes a while to get those questions mm-hmm. typed in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no worries. Okay. No worries. Well, thank you again. Yeah. And I will, once I get it up on Trecho Insights, I will send you a link for that as well. Okay. And so so you'll have that. But uh, but yeah, thanks. This was great. We had, we had people engaging. Well, not necessarily engaging in the comments, but I mean, I could see we had people on the whole time and, mm-hmm. and our numbers went up a little bit in the middle. And so, Good. so, and then there's a lot of people that join us afterwards for the replay. So cool. Yeah, no, that works. Yeah. Let, let me know if you need anything else. Let's keep in touch um, and working on collaborations, things like that. So if you need anything, just let me know. Okay, great. Same, okay. And same here. And yeah. uh, I'll keep you posted if I hear some great collaborations that come out of this group. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, thank you. That would, that would be awesome. All right. Yep. Well, we'll see you later. Okay. Have a good day. Mm -hmm. Bye now.